introductory into the book of Zechariah. And I think we'll find this book to be very interesting to spend some time in. Our time is going to be kind of quick, really, for what we have to cover. And the first chapter or two will probably go a little bit slow, just so we get the idea of, of working through some of, uh, of this prophecy. But then we'll have to kind of move along quicker on some of the other chapters. But as we're ending up on Wednesday night, I just want to read to you something from Psalm 34, just to bring this to our memory. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. And um, that psalm, to me, kind of puts in my mind some things that Zechariah is dealing with, some things that he is writing about. And the situation with uh, the children of Israel at the time. As we mentioned Wednesday night, here we are in a, in a space of time where there were those who were, were going back to Jerusalem. In fact, there are those who are already back in Jerusalem. The rebuilding of the temple's not been going well. Very slow. In fact, it didn't even come to a stop at a point. And, and, and the walls around the city, well, we're not even there yet. There's just been a lot of a slowness in getting some things done. But in the bigger picture of, of Zechariah, I think what we'll see as we go forward is that God is so fully aware of what's going on with his people and you know, who are the oppressors, who have caused difficult times for his people. And basically God's saying, you know, I'm going to deal with this. But at the same time, what he needs from his people is he needs some diligence. You know, he needs, he needs his people to stand up and, and to truly be his people, to, to live a lifestyle that would identify them as the people of God. They have some choices to make. And I think even as, as some have transitioned back to the homeland, back to Jerusalem, even the motivation of many of those is just not what it needs to be. Oh, yeah, they've done some of the right things, but, you know, where is the heart of the matter? Yeah so to say, where is their heart? Are, are they truly devoted to God? So there's some challenges here. And then when God looks at those who have been so oppressive on his people, <clears throat> he is seen having some problems with their aggression and how far they have gone. Now, getting a little ahead of ourselves on that, but looking at this, this big picture here. So as we, as we get now today, we're going more into our study of Zechariah. You know, this little trip back to Psalm here is just to remind us that God will deliver his people. He always has. He always will. That's a principle that is always true and something that I, I am hoping we take some comfort from. And even as we go through Zechariah, this, this book that was written so long ago, what we have to keep thinking about is, you know, what, what applications can we make? And I think there are many. There are applications here for us. And so we're going to Zechariah chapter 1. And uh, here's where we're going to be starting the morning, or the class this morning. And, and just, you know, a, a study tip that may be mentioned often. You know, when we see the visions in Zechariah, which we'll be getting into those today, boy, sometimes it's just hard to work through those. And to try to understand, like, what exactly does this mean? And, and I, I guess what I want to emphasize is that we just have to step back sometimes and see the big picture. That's what we need to understand is, is, is the big picture. That's the key for understanding this book. And so we go to Zechariah chapter 1. We'll read the first six verses here. <clears throat> In the eighth month of the second year of Darius... The word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo. The Lord was very angry with your forefathers. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your forefathers, to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed, this is what the Lord Almighty says, turn from your evil ways and your evil practices. But they did not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your forefathers now? And the prophets, 
do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your forefathers? Then they repented and said, The Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve, just as he determined to do. All right, start looking at that big picture right there. You know, the theme of the message of God through Zechariah is given to us right here. And how would you explain it? Uh, how would you explain the theme of this book? What would you say? Repent and turn from your evil ways. Okay. A continuing theme that we have seen. All through the prophets. All through the prophets. And even before the prophets, we see that. And so a, a primary point here is introduced right off. Return to me, the Lord says. On top of that, you saw what happens to those who don't repent. So it, it's like, you know, how short is your memory? You know, it, it, recall, think back. You know, the prophets that have come before, the prophets that came to your forefathers, what were they saying? It's all recorded. They would know. What were they saying? Well, return to me is what the Lord was saying through those prophets long ago. And so now, take that to the next step. When he says pertain, or, you know, pertaining to their forefathers, their ancestors, you know, what does he say about them and what application should they make? That was a horribly phrased question, but if you can make anything of that. What was he saying about their forefathers? They sinned and they got punished. Yeah. There, there was sin and there was punishment. And so he is saying to them, what should you do? Don't be like them. You know, the, the lessons learned. Don't be like them. You know, it, it, it's very clear. We know what the outcome will be if you if you live like them. You know, it, Doc, go ahead. I find it interesting in verse five. You know, where he just says, "Your fathers, where are they now? And the prophets, do they live forever?" You know, because we we focus so much as we should on the eternal life that mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. with God that we can have with God. Yeah. And here, right off the bat, he's pointing out to them, where are they? Mm -hmm. They're dead. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they have no hope at this time if they did not do this. So don't do like they did. Fix it. The application becomes very real for them, but for us as well. The application is the same. Okay, so we, we, we know. We, we, what about your forefathers? What happened to them? Well, they knew what happened to them. And, and he's saying, like, don't be like them. It's the same application for us. We, we, can, uh, we have this whole Bible story now that gives us the picture of those who would follow God and fall away, or those who determined to never follow him at all, or those who would be God's people. It's all painted out for us very clearly. And, and to these before who uh, were rebellious and turned from God, he's saying, don't be like them. You know, we, men do not live forever, but God and his purposes, well, they do. There's the contrast. You know, the forefathers had angered the Lord because of their rebellion, because of their spiritual apathy. I mean, sometimes when we read through, you know, the, the Bible story, we, we see God's people going through the motions of, of spiritual things. But there was always the heart problem. I shouldn't say always. That's too broad of a brush. There was too often heart problems going through the motions. But there was nothing to that. And the end result of that was, was never good. And so... To the people in Zechariah's day, he's saying to look back, see what you can learn. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul was in Romans 15, verse 4, I believe. You know, the things written beforehand were written for our learning. 
And in the text, he is talking about some things pertaining to um, life under the old covenant in the children of Israel long ago. And he was saying to the early Christians, you know, hey, these things are all written so you can learn something from it. Look, here we are today, still learning from these Bible examples, you know, of, of so long ago. So in this introduction, we might draw from this, okay, there is the repent, return to God. We, we see the consistency of, of um, what happens when men fail to obey God. It leads to disaster every time. We see the consistency of God. Think about this. We see the consistency of God in this, that God is never moving, God is never changing, and that what he wants and expects of, of men today is the same thing that he's always expected. God hasn't changed. You know, in, in living in a world where seemingly there's constant change, it's nice to know that there's consistency with God. So perhaps these are some of the, um, the, the standout points here in the introduction. Other thoughts you have with that? Phil. God's offering, offering them hope. And okay. He always keeps his promises, so his, his door is always open right. for them to come back. As, okay. It's not like you know you committed the unpardonable sin. Mm -hmm. He's always willing to forgive. Yeah. Okay. Good point. I'm really glad you bring that up. If there was ever a, a time in a people where God might just say, you know, there's never going to be hope for you, it would have been the children of Israel. Of course, He might say that of us today, even. But what we see from God is that if whenever we are willing to turn to him, that he is always there. He, cannot, he could not accept them in their sin. He cannot accept us in our sin. There's that consistency all the way through. All right, great. So in verse 7 and following, we get into some of these incredible visions. You know, and, and, and how many visions are there? There's a little speculation. It, can, it kind of depends how you divide things up. You know, some say there's seven visions or there's eight visions. Others count more. They kind of start breaking it down a little bit. Well, here's a story about this vision, but there's, an, there's sort of another vision kind of built into it, so to speak. And I don't know that it's really worth a lot of time trying to determine exactly how many visions are there. I think we've missed the point if that becomes our emphasis. But trying to understand what the message was through these visions is, is interesting. And I, can, I think can be very helpful in getting a good picture of God. We, we talked Wednesday night just some about Zechariah being apocalyptic type writing. It's a revelation. It's a revelation that's given to us in symbols or signs or visions, if you will. And... Um, Boy, it sure has led some off to some crazy ideas. Because if we're not able to take what is said to Zechariah with kind of a view or a picture of the greater Bible story, oh, wow, we can come up with some pretty crazy ideas. And we can go off in some far-fetched ways. But when we look at Zechariah in view of the Bible story, you know, some of it, becomes not so hard to understand when we're looking at that big picture. I mean, there are some aspects of it that, you know, what is, what is the different color horsemen? Or different, you know, what's the significance of the colors? You know, I really don't know. See some speculation about that. Maybe we can get some idea on this or that, but, you know, to pin it down exactly, what does that mean? I don't know. Maybe you've got that figured out. You can share it with us. But is that really the point of the vision? Like we said before, you know, sometimes you have to step back and, and think about what is the big picture of this? Or what are we supposed to walk away with? And perhaps there are some things that Zechariah and those of that day understood in a little more depth than what we will. That's okay. I can be good with that knowing that I can walk away, I think, with some understanding of what these visions are about. So we start reading here at verse 7. We're going to read several verses, okay? So I want you to follow along. In fact, I think we're going to read all the way through verse 17. Then we'll come back and kind of pick this off. We're going to spend a little time on this first vision. 
on the 24th day of the 11th month, the month of Shebat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Iddo. During the night I had a vision, and there before me was a man riding a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the ravine. Behind him were red, brown, and white horses. And I asked him, What are these, my lord? The angel who was talking with me answered, I will show you what they are. Then the man standing among the myrtle trees explained, They are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. And they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees, We have gone throughout the earth and found the whole world at rest and in peace. Then the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these 70 years? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Then the angel who was speaking to me said, Proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I am very angry with the nations that feel secure. I was only a little angry, but they added to the calamity. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt. And the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem, declares the Lord Almighty. Proclaim further. This is what the Lord Almighty says, My towns will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. Okay, we got all that. I wonder if there's some points we can kind of pull from this text that will help us to understand why this was important to those living at the time and maybe some thoughts or applications that, that, we can, that we can make too. You know the man standing among the myrtle trees. Why myrtle trees? Now, why is he standing? You know, why, why is there a red horse? And we can speculate a lot about some of those things, and I'm, I'm still not sure that we would really have an answer for that. But thinking about the big picture, you know, what is the overall message from God? You know, here is a vision that is so descriptive and, and so vivid. But what does it mean? And I'd like to hear just some thoughts. Let's start putting some ideas out there. I think it's interesting that God... Uh, Sent, sent these people, I guess, on the horses to patrol the earth. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like he's searching, uh, even though God, he knows all, and he doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have to do it in that manner. But I think the whole point is that he is patrolling the earth to see who, you know, what's going on, who may or may not be serving him. So I think this he's is looking, a... He's looking for... You know, his own. Yes, yeah. And he's aware of what they are doing, and he's aware of what everyone else is doing, too. And, and I think that's, that's interesting. I mean, literally, in the spiritual realm, does God have men on horses that are overseeing these things? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say no. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know that God and the spiritual beings is aware of all of these things. I know that there are battles taking place in, in a spiritual battlefield. Is that a somewhat literal type battlefield where God with his army on horses is fighting against Satan and his army on horses? You know, well, I don't know. I don't tend to think so, but at the same time, I'm not gonna say that's not the way it is. You know, I don't know, but we get the bigger picture. And, and I think you're right that what God is saying is, you know, I've sent out my scouts, my horsemen, and they've kind of looked this over. 
they've kind of sorted some things out. You know, they know what's going on, and they've reported back to me. So those are some things that we walk away with. Add to that. What else do we see? He wants them to acknowledge that they've sinned. And they need to ask for forgiveness and, uh, and then renew their covenant relationship with God. Here's again part of this big picture where if God sees all things and knows all things, he's wanting Israel to understand that. He's already proven to them, I know your sins. And, and because of those sins, well, some things changed for them. But also he's aware of what's going on throughout the world. You know, there's a somewhat similar type of symbol in, in Revelation chapter 6. There are the horsemen there that seem to depict world powers, you know, is, is the idea of this. In Revelation, of course, the, the issue that comes out of that, or conclusion that comes out of that, is whatever great powers these represent, of course, there's a lot of speculation, you know, of what or who those powers are, but that really doesn't even matter, because the big picture is God's power is greater. You know, that in, in that in the Revelation story. Well, I think perhaps there's some similarities here, you know, in, in this way. You know, that God has had his scouts that have looked over the world. They've, they've come back, and, and they're reporting back. They're reporting back here to, um, <clears throat> to the man on riding on the red horse in the myrtle trees. Why are they reporting back to him? What is, what is that supposed to be? I mean, there's a commander of every army, right? So whose army is this? And who are they reporting to? Would seem. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't give us a great explanation. Is this the angel of the Lord? Does this represent the Lord? It, has some inclination to that, I think. But that bigger picture is God knows what's going on throughout the world. Okay, what else? What else can we add to this? These, these yeah. people knew that they were going to be in captivity for seven years, 70 years. They had been told that. And they're near the end of that 70 years. So I think now the Lord is simply telling them, I'm watching. Now's the time for a big change. Anticipate it very soon. I think that's kind of the message. I think so. Okay, so I think this is another key point. You know, someone just reading through Zechariah, and, and, and some who have, have taken writings like this and gone off in such incredible ways will come to this 70 years and just do some weird things with it. You know, God told Israel that they were going in captivity. He told them how long it was going to be. You know, the 70 years. There, there's, there's nothing, there's no like hidden message with this. It, it, is, it is one of those consistence or constants that the Lord is saying, you know, okay, so this 70 years is coming to an end. The captivity is coming to an end. As we get into some of the other visions, it'll be a little bit more of a, okay, now this is coming to an end. What are you going to do? You know, but here, as, as that's just being introduced, it's like, you know, the Lord is, is kind of overseeing these things. He's looking at what's going on in, in all of the world. He knows that there's some big changes that's going to come because he's bringing these changes. And because he's even foretold that here's the timeline of when these changes are going to be. And it's like he is saying, okay, we're about there. And so... You know, sometimes people today kind of work and grapple through like, 70, what is that supposed to mean? If we look at the bigger part of the Bible story, he already told us what it's going to be. He foretold the time. They got into the time, and he says it's going to be for 70 years. Now it's coming to the end, and he's saying, it's, it's about done. The 70 years, remember I told you about that? You know? And so it's like the 70 years, to me, is the easiest part to understand. You know, because he has, has talked about that before. Okay, good, great. What, what else? Tim? Verse 13 intrigues me where it says, The Lord answered gracious and comforting words to this angel who talked with me. 
That reminds me of Hosea 2, where God said, I will allure her into the wilderness, and I will speak kindly to her. It sounds to me like the same thing. It does. It, it does. So, as this, this time of captivity is coming to an end, God has rendered the punishment that he said they were going to have to have and endure. It was because of their sins. You know, Phil, going back to Phil's point, it, it, it was because of their sins these things happened. And now he's trying to compel them again, you know, come back. And he, he's trying, to, he's going to be emphasizing that, hey, you know, there's a way back home. And that don't necessarily just mean Jerusalem. Jerusalem is that, that spiritual entity, you know, in a physical sense. But in the bigger picture, it's God calling them back to him. You know, to that home. That's, that's more of that, that bigger picture. Great. What, what else? This is great. Good points. What else can we see? Lydia. Um, what I get from this is uh, when people read the Old Testament, they have this view of God as what he's doing is they've done wrong and they've been punished and in verse 3 he's saying return to me return to me mm -hmm. and I think about when people do wrong to us we don't a lot of times we're waiting on them to come to us and say I'm sorry but God is going to them mm -hmm. the ones who have done him wrong and said come back to me you know, I will bless you I want to do all these great things with you and to me that shows how he's is and how loving, not this harsh, inaccurate image that people have, that I used to have of God. You, you think about the consistency of God. We've talked about this before. I just think it just comes out in such incredible ways we cannot miss this. God has never moved. Israel moved away from God and, and, he, and, and he turned off from them because of their sin. But Israel has moved from God. Now he's saying, come back, return to me. You know, come back. I'm still right here. It's like, what do you say? You know, he hasn't moved. And, and of course, the stipulations haven't changed. You can't be living in sin and come back. You know, the door is closed if you're living in sin. But the door is open if you have repented and you're coming back to me. That's the consistent Bible story. It's the same thing Jesus would teach. And so in, in the Christian era, Christian age, it's the same point and same message. You know, um, there's, this, there's this vision in my mind here of, of how God would be calling his people to come to him and how compassionate he is and, and how much he has tried to provide a means of his people to come back to him. There's getting to be a little more of a, of a common idea that I hear among some today about how, you know, God will take you just as you are. <coughs> so you don't chirp signs sometimes. God has never said that. God has never accepted that. He's always been there for those who are turning come to him. Or this idea that God is going to, to chase us down, you know, to, to capture us, to, to save us. God has never run after those who are in sin. How could he? How could God run after those who are in sin? He makes an invitation for those who are in sin to turn around and come to him. But an idea that God is running after us to save us? I mean, okay, I, I understand maybe what some are trying to suggest, that God wants us to repent. Yes, I get that. I think sometimes we have to be careful that we don't start painting another picture, that wherever we are in sin, God will come to us there and accept us. That's not the picture here. That's not what he's saying here. So, I don't know. Just a little side point. Just a thought with that. Okay, other thoughts with this? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, that song that we sing, Just As I Am, uh, yeah. that, <clears throat> is kind of like, like what you're saying, but on the condition you repent. Yes. Uh, and that also reminds me of Luke 13, about the tower that fell on these people, and Jesus was making a point, and that uh, the, they mixed the blood of the people yeah. that were sacrificing the idols. I can't remember the whole thing. But uh, his point was that you repent. Yes, it does. So things happen. You people die untimely deaths, and accidents happen. But the point is, repent. You know, just as I am, so it's an incredible old hymn yeah. that depicts a humble and contrite heart. You know, and, and it's kind of the idea of what what do I have to offer God? You know, I. I've not done anything by merit to earn a relationship with God. There's nothing that I can give God, but a humble and contrite heart, you know, just as I am. Well, that's a that's a beautiful theme, you know, and, and a and a biblical theme, you know, that way, right? I was gonna piggyback off of what you said, the whole "just as I am" movement. Um, mm -hmm. That we see in the Bible, it's very comforting. God will take you just as you are. Mm -hmm. You know, you're human, you sin. As long as you love God, that's the kind of message that I think a lot of people are sending out. So when you're new to Christianity mm -hmm. and you hear, like, I can still live this way, but then, you know, God knows my heart. He's and gonna just He's gonna take me as I am. That's what half half of the message that they're portraying mm -hmm. is is correct. Mm -hmm. You know, that that God, if we turn and repent, everything bad in our life hasn't just fallen away. You know, we're, we're still dealing with the consequences of that. You know, God's, God's going to meet us with that, meet us there with that. You know, but again, you know, the idea that God just accepts us walking in sin and we can stay in sin, no, that's, that's never been a biblical concept. Just as I am is a wonderful song. It's written by a woman who was... was heavily handicapped. She spent most of her time in bed. And a man tried to teach her the gospel. And she said to him, God will never take me in, in my conditions. And I'm no, I'm no use to the Lord. And the guy said, no, he'll take you just as you are. Yeah. That is the context. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I love that. that. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Okay, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, uh, we see here that God is a jealous God as well. Okay. We see a lot of that throughout the scriptures. So mm -hmm. God you know, really, really wants his people to stay with him. Yes. I mean, everyone. Sure. Ultimately. But, uh, yeah, he's a very jealous God. And it's a righteous jealousy. A righteous jealousy. You know, um, jealous in that he does not want us walking with the world and walking in sin. And from God's perspective, if we can even try to understand and relate to God's perspective. Of, of how he must feel and what he must think to see us when we choose to do what's wrong and choose to do evil. And, and what he must think that we've chosen the world over him. Jealous in that regard? Yes. We, we, we read about God's uh, godly type jealousy. There's something else I want to make sure we talk about. And like in verse, verse 12, I think it's such an interesting phrase. Then the angel of the Lord said, um, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, <coughs> which you have been angry with for these 70 years? The how long, I think is an interesting phrase. You know, it's a, it's a similar phrase to what's found in Revelation chapter 6 when with regard to the Christians, the saints who have perished, who have been martyred, and who are, whose blood is under the altar, I think is the way Romans, uh, Revelation chapter 6 says it, verses 9 through 11, I believe it is. And, um, you know, and, and the petition is, Lord, how long, how long, you know, before you come, you know, is the idea. So, similar thing right here, where the angel of the Lord is, is saying or praying, how long, O Lord, until this comes to an end? Well, the answer is kind of given too. Well, 70 years. When the 70 years is up, you know, is when this is going to show. To me, what's 
what makes that all the more interesting, you know, what word does that verse start with? Then. Mm -hmm. So what was before that? You know, so they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, all the earth mm -hmm. is resting quietly. Mm -hmm. All the earth mm -hmm. is at peace. When has that ever been? Mm -hmm. So in one moment in history, all the earth. I, I think that's an interesting thing too, you know, because God's horsemen, you know, have been out kind of scouting the earth and seeing what's going on. Well, one scholar said, I thought it was kind of an interesting point. Here was a period of time where Darius, King Darius, is is the one in in charge, <coughs> and there was a period of time when he had conquered what he was conquering. Uh, other countries were in submission to him, and there was a period of time in Darius's reign where there were no there were no great um, uh, wars going on. Now, in places farther away from there, I, I don't know, but this is about the children of Israel, you know, and, and about Babylon and captivity and, and such as that. And so, it, maybe as well, God has, has brought about this time of peace where his, his children, you know, they, they have some choices to make. I mean, some are going to, are going to choose to stay in Babylon. They're going to stay in this pagan nation and culture. Some things have been good to them then. There's been some prosperity in things like that. But God is calling them home. He's calling them to him. He's calling them back to Jerusalem. But you notice he's not going to force them into captivity to Jerusalem. And so maybe there is some relative peace in the world regard. You know, they're not being forced to stay in Babylon. They're not being forced to return to Jerusalem. They're going to have to choose which way they will go. Maybe that's part of that I, in the overall picture. Listen, on Wednesday night, God willing, we'll spend just a few more minutes kind of finishing up some thoughts here and then start working into the other visions. No, we can't take a whole class period on every vision. We're going to have to go a little bit faster on some of those. But I wanted to spend some extra time. This was a little bit longer one. And, and just kind of start learning how to work our way through some of these visions. We'll try that some more Wednesday. Does anybody need chapter, or lesson number two? Has everybody got that? Yeah, thank you. It was here Wednesday night. Okay, good. Appreciate y'all being here.